Oh, I, where did it freeze? What was I talking about when it froze? That you were talking about the anchor. Okay, right. The, the point that I'm making is that uh, past that a little bit is people will say, what happens if everybody's going to become a monk? And I was saying that that's really not going to happen because it takes a lot of wisdom. That in fact, that's one of the major differences between Achan Cha and Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, that Achan Cha really wanted to have a Western Sangha of monks. And Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa was more interested in the super mundane Dhamma coming to the West. That it does not take robes in order to, to wise up. <laughs> and, and Ajahn Chah is the teacher of Tanisaro, right? Or am I, am I confused there? There is some connection with Tanisaro, but it's um, not direct. Under Achan Cha comes Semedo. And, und and I met Semedo in 1984 at Wat Suan Mok when he was there with Achan Cha to visit Achan uh, Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. So I know for sure, not only because of the photographs and the stories, but I have direct evidence that Achan Cha was a student of Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. And um, anyway, under Semedo comes Amaro and Pisano. And then under them, a lot of others, including uh, 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 Achan Brahm, Brahmali, uh, uh, Subharo. Uh, gosh, <laughs> there's many now in this generation that I've never met. Uh, but that that group, uh, and I'll, I'll explain it to you very quickly this way. Uh, the Thai people are chauvinistic, and part of their chauvinism is is that we are better than Westerners. That Westerners are crude, they drink, they're loud, they're uncouth, they're barbarian. Okay, in other words, they point their fingers at our society, just like we point our fingers at their society. Okay, and so Achan Cha wanted to make sure that if he was going to be able to get a Western Sangha going, that that Sangha had to be up to the Thai standards. These young men, these Westerners had to behave appropriately uh, while all of these Thai people were watching. In fact, the Thai people weren't even watching their own kids becoming monks. They were too interested watching the Farang. And so they had to be on guard for that. The outcome of that is, is that the uh, uh, Achan lineage has become too attached to the rules of being a monk. And it's become very, even though the history is there and the lineage is there, the nobility is available to them. But getting stuck into clinging to the rules is one of the problems of turning loose of things. Uh, it's the second fetter, very low fetter, and it's very difficult for uh, Achan Cha's students to uh, be able to, how to, how to say, um, balance that wisdom with that deep set of rules that they've been ingrained with. Uh, so... Uh, but the but the hair, but the lineage is still there. It's, it's very well known that Achan uh, uh, Cha was uh, also noble. That, that that is well known, and that uh, um, when we talk about the Thai forest tradition, that label is normally applied in particular to the Northeast Thai group. But the actual label, when it's not a label, it's just a generic description, you find out that it always oh, all over Thailand. It's not just the Northeast, that the Thai forest tradition. In fact, uh, Achan Cha being from the Northeast, and still he would come, and, that, and, and especially in the old days, that was quite a journey for Achan Cha to come down to Wat Suan Mok to visit and pay homage to Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. So that shows that that whole idea of the forest tradition is not because it's got a label on it now for the Western mind uh, solely for uh, the Northeast, which is including Achan Mun and Achan Li Damodaro uh, and Achan Puang and bound to uh, uh, Tanisaro 
from that lineage. Okay, so that's uh, his lineage. So his his lineage is actually a little bit more remote uh, than Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa's lineage is to Achan Cha. Achan, uh, Achan Cha and his group are closer to Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa by lineage than they are to uh, um, uh, Tanisaro, even though Tanisaro also is out of that same what they call the forest tradition, but the forest tradition is not just in that, that locale or that area. So uh, that's that's the side point of, of what we were uh, d- discussing. But anyway, getting back to the Petitia Samuppada and the, um, the way that these early parts work is, is that people think that the site and the contact with the uh, um, the eye and the eye's object is the same sankara as the sankara that is in second. That's why they say that ignorances cause sankara. Sankara causes consciousness. That when you say it like that, that's stupid. It's wrong. Anybody can see that that's wrong. All right. But when you understand the way that it's actually structured and why it's structured that way because of past, present and future. And to recognize that uh, that that when the eye meets an object, the eye itself is a Sankara of the body. But the new Sankara that arises is not the same Sankara that the eye is a part of the body. Now the new Sankara is the eye touches the object. And the, and we call that sight. Okay, and so sight is a kind of consciousness. Sound is a kind of consciousness. Touch. Okay, so, so, so the, because you said this, so the eye is a part of the body, that's like the first system right and then there's another system with the object meeting the eye and then there's another system with all the thoughts arriving from that exactly and so in that regard we can label and say that consciousness now is defined as knowledge of contact okay but that knowledge of contact is rupa the physical world contacts the human being at one of the sense doors. And that that uh, that contact there is not called pasa because pasa is an emotional ab- eruption into a feeling. The real pasa or the real contact is not the uh, physical object. That tree is way out there. It can't. It only light beams contact the eyes. But if I see that tree falling and I have perception and all of that kind of stuff, then then the realization that the tree is falling, that's what contacts us. That's mm-hmm. the pasta. That's what I get it now. All right. As opposed to a very very tiny little thing of merely seeing the object. But we can actually take it down to where I'm not even going to look at any particular object to be seen because I'm not taking an object. So the so the sight is there and that kind of scene is now not putting together through perception and through the old sand cars the namings, the labels, the feelings and all of that kind of stuff that come into that perception. We don't have to do that if we don't take a visual object or if we don't take a sound object. All right. Now, at the other end of that scale, sometimes uh, a sound sight object will contact us at such a deep level that we have almost no choice. All right. Like having a bolt of thunder and lightning come uh, happen very, very close. <laughs> Not actually getting struck, but the whole world lights up all around you while at the same time there's enormous thud and it impacts the body kind of like a way of being stepped on by an elephant. <laughs> and and uh, that happened not long ago here at the house that it was just unbelievable. But the, but the point that I'm, I want to point is that 
everybody in the house was in the air. They just jumped. I mean, everything just went <gasps> like that instantly. But me, I was laughing. because I've, got, I've already gotten over the startle reflex. I was amazed in the sense that, oh, this is really interesting. But I was also, um, uh, let's say, quite entertained by everybody in the house just going into, start, you know, very strong startle reaction. All right. That startle reaction is because the, uh, the hearing and the eyes have two different kinds of pathways in the human brain. In other words, the ear doesn't go, this left ear doesn't go uh, to some place and then to one auditory area. There's actually two auditory areas. One is in the frontal cortex and one is in the anterior cortex. And that's even more true with the eyes. All right. That there's actually um, uh, the, the eyes are connected. I, when, I, when I started looking at maps of the, of the brain uh, in more recent times, I was quite curious to see that that's exactly true. That some things we see, we have to react to because that's connected directly into the uh, reptilian brain. And his only possibility is to react. But when you also have the uh, the frontal cortex having that same data, you can keep that reaction down. In other words, I did react to that uh, uh, that lightning flash, but not the same way that everybody else did. Another so example could, of that. You could see it at a deeper level, right? You could see the reaction before it, it came to startle. Right, before it went to startle, it was just kind of raw without adding startle yeah, yeah, to it, yeah. without adding fear and, and all of that other. All right, here's a second example of that. I was over at Watsu and Mok one day, and Brenda said, be careful, watch out, uh, the, the snakes are out, and we know what they, uh, these are ass. They're, they are poisonous, but not very poisonous. They're small, they're short, they are uh, blackish color on top and orange color on uh, underneath. And sure enough, here I am walking barefoot out and there's one right in front of me. But I see him before he sees me and I stop. And I see him recognizing there's no danger. He picks his head up, he looks around, doesn't coil or anything, just slithers off. Mm -hmm. No problem, intellectual part of the brain, no problem, see it before it happens and everything. Meanwhile, the heart rate, I noticed, had gone up. The heart rate had gone up, preparing for fight or flight. This is really interesting that that happens in the body because we have both parts of the brain uh, in operation. And if uh, it's only the reptilian part of the brain that's in operation and the frontal cortex is not, then that's what gives rise to doing really stupid things in the presence of a snake or startle reactions or other things like this. And so I wanted to mention that to you, but it's actually inside the mind that that lightning contacts and it explodes inside the mind the realization of it is overpowering to people that's the contact mm -hmm. it's not the sight of the or the sound of it it's the internal reaction to that explosive noise another example of that is that um you're you're living in an area that's got a very slanted roof and is covered with snow fill of snow Late in the winter, the dog is laying on the floor by the fire, and all of a sudden, that whole roof full of snow goes crashing off the side into a big pile. All right. The owner knows exactly what's going on. He knows the time of year. He's almost expecting it. But when that dog hears that, the dog goes nuts. <laughs> sure. Because he has no wisdom to counteract the uh, uh, the enormity of the input of the sensations. Yeah, so it, I can I can see that it's also like um, the the each and each sensation like compounds, right? If we have like 
if we see something, then we get a strong emotional reaction. We have bodily um, bodily sensations, which are really strong, and it, this all compounds to a really big problem, so to say. And if we can be aware of of each each of these things, so we we are aware that we see, we are aware of the bodily sensations, then it it like doesn't build up to this. Exactly. And in fact, you're just a half a step ahead of me already. Congratulations. You're exactly we're going right there. All right. Here's what happens. There are physical feelings in the body, sensations, and there are feelings in the mind. But the feelings in the mind that, that uh, spread the chemicals in the mind, especially the dopamine and all of that kind of stuff, is normally coming out of an area called the amygdala, which is part of the reptilian brain. In other words, the body is under the control of the reptilian brain, not under the control of the frontal cortex. For that reason, feelings that are mental and feelings that are physical are so deeper deeply interrelated and that you can see that in the sense that when people have emotion it's always going to register in the body all right so if somebody uh loses a loved one and they have grief all right grief is a physical feeling it's a feeling of sinking of loss kind of a feeling of terror but it's a body feeling all right, the feeling of anger. When people feel angry, their their uh, their throat will tighten up. Partly, the reason that that happens is is because uh, predatory animals always go for the throat. I've even noticed we've got a um, a new kitty here. About been here almost a month now, and now the dog and the cat are making friends. But whenever the, the and you can imagine the kids with the kitty's with her hand here, and the kitty comes up to the face of the dog. What the dog wants to do is grab him by the throat, but he won't quite do it because she know he knows that I'm there. <laughs> but but that's the natural tendency is to go for the throat. All right. If the natural tendency for the dog to grab the, the cat by the throat, that sign is extraordinarily deeply buried into the genes on both the guy that's biting the throat and the guy who's got a throat. That's why the throat tenses up when we get angry. It's part of our genes. <laughs> Is for is a protection mechanism. Not only that, but other areas of the body will tighten up with anger. Now, the really interesting one is anxiety, because anxiety is not an intense situation like anger or um, or grief, but it can build up over time. In fact, I'm beginning to think that there's a major relationship between cortisol and anxiety. Because cortisol is produced by the adrenaline gland, but it takes a long time for it to build up. So when people age, they begin to have a lot of cortisol in their body to where the uh, adrenaline itself will peak and then die out and can be breathed out. But the cortisol will build up in the blood over time. That's an, that's anxiety. And in fact, in many ways, you could call that that's really the stress. The, the stress is is kind of left over from uh, angers, sadnesses, tensions, all of that kind of stuff that create chemicals. There's a little bit of residue that's going to build up over time. And that the way to start to deal with that is, again, by oxygenating the blood, by breaking that stuff up. So when uh, in that time, when I was, let us say, when I was studying psychology, I understood anxiety, really understood it, but didn't know what to do about it. Later as a monk with Gawanka, by doing the body scannings, I could localize it where it was. But it was only with Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa when I learned to actually break it up and throw it out. And that is by watching it closely and just sitting there with it, knowing that, oh, watch that stuff break up. It's almost a mental attitude. Uh, watch that anxiety just melt away. Just watch it go. Just take a deep breath and watch that stuff. <gasps> it just feels so good to just let it out. Okay. And that's the kind of attitude that you have, and it'll just melt away 
And pretty soon you get to the point that any time that it begins to build up, you can see it, take a deep breath, out it goes. And I think eventually then the cortisol will start to uh, diminish for elderly people. And so teaching this, this breathing meditation techniques alone without dhamma will be of enormous value to the uh, to a large number of people if they would learn to do that, to get rid of that tension and anxiety that builds up 